Did you ever worry about those kinds of side effects? Yes, but those potential risks are outweighed, I think, by the potential benefits. Of the within Sean Doyle's body, within his blood, may lie the path to a vaccine for COVID-19. Great. Less than one month Great. after the novel coronavirus's genome was sequenced, vaccine trials began. There are now at least six vaccine trials underway, including this one at Emory University, part of the National Institute of Health's first human clinical trials. The vaccine is called mRNA-1273, and Sean is one of 45 people in Atlanta and Seattle that are part of the first phase of the study, testing it for safety. I think to myself, if you were my son and you came to me and said, I want to do this, what would I tell you? Did you ever have a conversation like that with your parents or anybody else? Yes, there were conversations that I had with friends and family, but they trusted my judgment. So here's how it works. I gave some blood samples to be used as a baseline for assessing my health after getting the vaccine and to uh, also use as a baseline to determine whether or not there was any sort of immune response that my body was able to generate in response to getting the vaccine later. If it's successful, it may not only help get the world back to normal, but it could also be a game changer for other therapeutics and vaccines. Why? Because of its technology. Instead of using the actual virus, which could inadvertently cause an infection, or even an inactivated form of the virus, this vaccine relies on mRNA, messenger RNA, which is just the genetic blueprint of the virus. It directs our cells to make the coronavirus's unique spike protein, which is the virus's key to unlocking the door into our cells. Once our body recognizes that, our immune system should be primed to create antibodies. If it works, it's a potentially safer and faster path, shortening the development process from decades to years or even months. Getting it into phase one in a matter of months is the quickest that anyone has ever done literally in the history of vaccinology. But speed is just one consideration. After all, it is a new technology. It's possible. There's no actual production of antibodies um, in which uh, because... Uh, either the mRNA didn't get into the cells, the cells didn't make the proteins from the mRNA, or the immune system didn't recognize those proteins, um, the, or the dose was too low. Dr. Evan Anderson is the lead investigator for the trial at Emory University. There's a theoretical possibility that you could actually see an enhanced immune response that's actually um, a problem in the setting of subsequent COVID-19 exposure. That's called sensitization and means the body would overreact the next time it is exposed to the coronavirus, causing a storm of potentially deadly inflammation. Plus, anything new will have unknowns and risks. You can have um, some pain or tenderness at the site of injection. Um, you can have nausea. Um, you can sometimes develop fever. As part of the trial, Sean gets two doses of the vaccine, his second just this past week and he's followed up with check-ins and blood draws to measure potential changes to his system for the following year. Like nothing happened. You did good. It really felt just like a flu shot, and after the tenderness subsided after about a day or two, um, I really felt totally fine afterward. Contamination at a CDC lab was the likely cause of critical early delays in rolling out testing. And CNN political correspondent Sarah Murray is with us here. Sarah, what are you learning? Well, you know, there was this sort of dark spot in February when the CDC shipped out its first test. The tests were not working for these public health officials in the states who received them. And it turns out that internally, sources are telling us, the CDC was also struggling to figure out what was going on. They didn't know if it was a manufacturing problem. They didn't know if it was a problem with the way they had designed their test. So eventually, uh, in mid-February, an official from the FDA goes down to Atlanta to look at these CDC labs and an administration official tells me that, that what this FDA official found was that the labs where the CDC was manufacturing this test were contaminated. And that's essentially 
what was most likely causing these tests to malfunction when they went out to the states. So it took a little bit of time after that for the CDC and the FDA to work together to figure out how they were going to remanufacture some of these tests so that they weren't contaminated and how they were going to advise states to be able to use some of the tests that they already had on hand. You know, in this period, Anna, this was a really critical time. It was a time when you talk to public health officials where they knew, especially out west in places like Washington State and California, they knew that it was most likely true that the virus was spreading in their communities, that it was potentially spreading person to person. And they kind of felt like sitting ducks because they had this very limited ability to test. And you know, this was an issue that essentially continued until the end of February when they got some of this, this testing up and running. And it's still an issue, Anna. The, the access mm -hmm. to widespread testing is a key issue the administration is still facing as they try to reopen the economy. And it's such a key part of being able to reopen. Sarah Murray, thank you for that reporting. So that was February when contamination at a CDC lab was the likely cause of the critical early delays in rolling out testing. This was the president in early March when he visited the CDC in Atlanta. Listen. Anybody that needs a test gets a test. We, they're there. They have the test. And the tests are beautiful. I like this stuff. I really get it. People are surprised that I understand it. Every one of these doctors said, how do you know so much about this? Maybe I have a natural ability. Maybe I should have done that instead of running for president. To be clear, a month and a half later, everyone who wants a test still cannot get a test. And Sanjay, you live in Georgia as well. Uh, it's starting next Monday. You could go out to a restaurant. Uh, but a study, a very intriguing study from China, shows just how easily the virus can spread when you're out to dinner with family or friends. Uh, explain what we learned from this study. Yeah, I mean, I want to show you this, this graphic. This is sort of an overhead shot of a few restaurant tables. This is on the CDC's website. I don't want to alarm people. I want to educate them with this. So. Uh, three family clusters, uh, three families having uh, a meal at a restaurant. The middle table is table A. There's a person at that table who is uh, subsequently test positive for the coronavirus infection. Doesn't know it at the time, feeling fine. But look what happens there, Wolf. Uh, the red, line, the red uh, circles represent people who then become infected by this one person. Four people at that person's table, table A. Three people at the table behind this person. Two people at a table one table over, nine additional people overall become infected from this one person. This, this is the concern. I mean, uh, you're sitting in a restaurant, you have more prolonged contact with people as a result of that. I think they said the average was around an hour that these people were in contact with each other. But you can, it's just a reminder of how contagious this is and the concerns if you start to open restaurants again. As the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus a global pandemic, the number of prescriptions being written for anti-anxiety medications soared. According to Express Scripts, a pharmacy benefits manager, just days after the announcement, prescriptions for drugs like Xanax and Valium spiked by 34%. Women saw almost double the increase as men, with usage going up by 40%. And it's not surprising that people are feeling the toll on their mental health. Most of the country is under stay-at-home orders, schools are closed, and unemployment is at record levels. In a Kaiser Family Foundation poll earlier this month, 45% of people said that stress related to the coronavirus had a negative impact on their mental health. And in a separate poll from the American Psychiatric Association, nearly half of the respondents said they were anxious about contracting the virus. And another 62% said they were worried about a loved one getting it. As we continue to deal with the unpredictable, make sure you are not only finding constructive ways to manage stress, but continue reaching out to those around you. For today's Health Minute, I'm Melissa Rainey.